Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you are listening to Revived Thoughts. And all you members of Park Street, you who remember what your God has done for you, especially never distrust the power of the Spirit. You have seen the desert blossom like the rose. Trust him for the future. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history in a sermon that they delivered today. We are going to Northfield, Massachusetts in the year 1890 to hear a sermon that D.L. Moody preached. It's titled, Power of the Holy Spirit. D.L. Moody is America's most famous evangelist, at least for the 1800s. We have covered him before in the sermon, Temptation, and also in the sermon that was called his final sermon. We've also covered people who were affected by him and his work, such as R.A. Torrey and John and Betty Stam. So if you've not listened to those episodes, I highly recommend you download those right now while you're listening to this one so that you will be ready for some really great episodes. Uh, There's an interesting parallel between Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody that I learned about in this episode. I love little parallels. I love like when history and things kind of interact with each other in my in my mind. And and these are two of history's greatest, most famous preachers. And for them to have lived at the same time and to have the same parallel, I just thought was really surprising. Just a little teaser for you. It's coming up later in the episode a little bit, but it's about fire. So we're going to talk about that in a minute and uh, just some aspects of his life that we've not covered before. Because we've had him on the show, we're not going to go through his entire life step by step. If you haven't if you want to know that story, go check out those earlier D.L. Moody's. But for this one, we're just going to kind of bounce around and catch different aspects of his life that I think really stand out. Yeah, when you when you think about it, D.L. Moody and uh, Spurgeon, they kind of have a lot of commonalities, right? Kind of both in that same era. Moody here, he was born in 1837. Spurgeon uh, was born in 1834. So they're born in that same decade, and they actually die within a few years of themselves as well. And just recently on Revived Thoughts, I believe it was last episode, we had a Hudson Taylor episode, also kind of this same era. So we're, we're taking, and, and these, these speakers in this area throughout the mid to late 1800s, they are overlapping in ways. Their, their stories overlap, their ministries overlap. Taylor and Moody would actually work on uh, the same projects later in Moody's life. And the thing about Moody and Spurgeon, you know, if we're comparing them, is they don't really have great formal education. Moody never went past the fifth grade when he was growing up and going through school, yet he would go on to found multiple schools, the most famous of which would be the Moody Bible College, which most people have heard of in today's day and age. And after a trip to England where he would do a preaching tour, one of the churches of which was Spurgeon's church at that time, he became an evangelical sensation and he held these huge revivals on both sides of the Atlantic. But his early life was not the easiest, his family life especially. His dad's uh, business failures had just stressed him out. He had huge debts to pay. Uh, to the point that he would actually die just at the age of 41. People believe it was just a disease and the stress killed him. And when he died, uh, the creditors came and pretty much took everything from the family that was left. Moody was only four years old at the time, one of his earliest memories. And uh, it left his mother having to pay for Moody and like seven other siblings at that time. His mother then would give birth to twins just a month later after her husband had died. So she was, you know, very pregnant at that time, gave birth to twins. Uh, People recommended that she should give her other children off to relatives, workhouses, just kind of, you can't take care of all of them and just focus on these twins here, Uh, especially because she got really sick after the birth, you know, giving birth to twins took a lot out of her. But she didn't do it. She held on to the whole family and she believed that she needed to take care of all of them and stick with all of them. But that wasn't the last of the tragedies of this early time period because uh, the oldest son whom the mother expected to kind of get a job and start helping out, help her to get through this hard time. He was 15 years old and he decided he did not want to do that. Moody later on said in a sermon that he just read too many books and stories of men going out and getting their riches and he ran away from home and didn't come back for many, 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 many years long past uh, D.L. Moody and them reaching adulthood. In this environment, this farm life, way out in the backwoods with no dad, uh, that's where Moody was raised. He was mischievous. He heard a lot about God from family and church, but it left very little impression on him overall. He was undereducated. He left home at 17 himself to become a shoe salesman. His goal, he said, was to amass a fortune, $100,000 selling shoes or whatever else he could. And nothing in, this, in his life 
would ever give you the hint that at, that at work behind the scenes was God and he was going to do something great through him. Yeah, he was saved while working at his uncle's shoe store and he soon became involved with the, the YMCA that was in the area. He began preaching and he, he, off he went, right? That was his career. But he was he was a baby Christian. He was just learning. He actually failed his church membership because he wasn't able to do well during the oral exam. You know, this person that would become the, the such an influential preacher, he, he didn't have good enough public speaking. He wasn't knowledgeable enough to actually pass the test to, to be, just to be a member. That was something they did back then. Recently, we had a, an episode with David Livingston, and it's just interesting to see how many of these great people have failed in their early days. They've tried, and they did not have success, and perhaps that's God's way of humbling them so that the, he can better use them for you know he knows that these people need to be humbled uh, to to become who they need to be in order to serve Christ as he grew as a christian he he went to a revival in england he wanted to learn from people like spurgeon and from people like george mueller and he focused on putting himself in better circles he wanted to surround himself and to be encouraged and be educated by people that were smarter than him and and were more knowledgeable and more on passion more on fire for Jesus than him. And so, you know, that would lead opportunities to meet other people. And those circles would lead for opportunities to meet other people. It's kind of like the proverb says that those who walk with the wise become wise. In 1861, in Charles Spurgeon's church, a person yelled fire, you know, yelling fire in a crowded room. People ran for the doors and it created a massive panic and people were crushed. They died in this moment being trampled to death. Others were scarred or injured for life. This moment nearly broke Spurgeon of his ability to preach. It it haunted him for the rest of his days. A decade later, a similar incident involving fire would hang heavy on Moody for the rest of his life. That's the thing I mentioned at the top of the show. In 1871, he was preaching a sermon to his congregation, and he was really worried about their souls, so he gave them a challenge. He said, spend this week asking yourself, you know, do you need Christ? Really get right with the idea that you need to come to Christ. Don't do it in this moment out of fear or anything like that. You know, I don't want to get false converts. I want to make sure you're committed. So spend this week and really ask yourself that question. And next week, I'm going to give you an altar call and you need to come forward. You need to accept the Lord. But, you know, think about it this week. And next Sunday, we're doing that. Uh, So come ready next week to church to give your life to God. He thought this would ensure that many of them were serious when they came that next week, ready to devote themselves to the cause of Christ. I've kind of actually heard of people doing this. I've met pastors who kind of think this way. They they are very fearful of the idea of emotions leading someone along too much, and so then they worry that, uh, that it won't be a genuine confession. And this was kind of what it seems like to me Moody was doing. He didn't want some emotional acceptance of God, just the real thing. And so I think Moody was trying to give them time. Well, as the worship leader was singing off the last song, uh, they said they couldn't fully hear it end. Um, and this man, the worship leader of Sankey, would actually tour and worship with Moody through all his evangelistic services. He's a very special guy himself. But as they were closing that service, the, the song was drowned out by the sound of the fire department's sirens going off and church bells across the city beginning to ring. Yeah, yeah, the Great Chicago Fire. That, that Moody was in Chicago during the Great Chicago Fire. This is 1871, and this is, is in American history, one of the worst fires that we've seen in the, in the continental USA. 300 people die, three square miles of homes would be burned. Over 100,000 homes were in that fire, in that destruction path of the fire. Moody's home uh, would be lost in the fire, and he said he saved nothing but his Bible and his reputation. His family and him were homeless for a time, after that, almost all of Chicago was built out of wood at the time, even the sidewalks. So once this fire got going, there was nothing that could stop it. And to make matters a little bit worse, the firemen w- actually went to the wrong place at the start of the fire. And so they had to double back around to get to where the fire was. It all just kind of culminated in an out-of-control out of fire that couldn't be stopped. Moody said that moment haunted him until his dying days, that he let them go home without offering Christ to them, that people in that congregation went home to think it over for a week, but they never lived to see the end of that week. People in that congregation died. 
He was never a pastor over that congregation again. He said that he would never preach and not offer Christ on the spot after that. He would never add, he would not add to the souls that he believed would rise up and say he didn't warn them. He didn't give them the chance on Judgment Day. This was in 1871. Now, Moody is without a doubt one of the most influential evangelists of all time. I saw one quote that said that Moody preached the gospel to 100 million souls. Now, I am not sure how they could possibly calculate such a bafflingly high number, and are they including tracks, and are they including students that came after him? I'm not sure where you know what was the process that went into 100 million, but just the fact that we're talking about a number that big as possibly being associated with him, that tells you how just magnificent and gigantic his influence was. Yeah, Moody never let that moment go, but he also... He never let it hold him back either from future ministries. By the end of his life, he will have established four different schools that helped 5,000 students in his lifetime. His schools were different than most. They were set up to help poor people, Native Americans, African Americans, women were all taught there. And not only were they taught an education, but they were taught to serve as well. Something else he had, that, that Moody kind of pioneered in these schools was this idea of lay projects. People came there to learn how to serve. They worked on farms. They worked on projects around the city. It was far more than just a school for academics. It was one meant to teach you how to be a servant-hearted leader. D.L. Moody himself being, a, you know, a lay person coming into this, he wasn't trained by a seminary. He would end up establishing one of, one of the biggest and one of the most well-known Bible colleges in the world. Your car doesn't get much of a summer break. Bugs, UV rays, and pollen can all cause damage. Stay protected at WetGo with WeatherShield and a free month of unlimited washes. Just purchase your first month of WetGo Go Unlimited and your second month is free. Wash as many times as you want. And when you choose our all-weather or showroom pass featuring WeatherShield, you'll say bye-bye to bugs all summer long. Sign up today at getgocafe.com slash unlimited. I never heard this one before, but apparently back in his day, one of his nicknames was Crazy Moody. He was just always doing stuff outside the box to reach people for the gospel. One way was that he bought a pony for Sunday schools. Kids like riding ponies, and he figured, hey, if you come to class and read your Bible with me afterwards, uh, you can ride this pony. Always thinking of different ways to get them to come and hear the gospel. And always looking to help the poor, too. He reminds me of Paul uh, when the Jerusalem church... Uh, basically said, okay, Paul, you're an apostle, but they say, you need to remember the poor. And Paul was like, that's what I wanted to do anyway. And I'm not sure any one minister remember the poor and just reminds me of that verse as much as Moody seems to. Every project he does seems to be about pulling the poor out of poverty through education, work, and Christ. Finally, the last thing we'll say about him in this episode is that he loved to use anecdotes. Moody was a regular part of Revive Devos. Uh, he would be one of the teachers. If you go check out Revive Devos, you'll see a Moody Devo every week for a long time. And he was always really fun to edit for me because he has so many stories inside of those devotionals. So people questioned Moody, should you use so many anecdotes? Should you just skip, you know, stick to scripture? What, what is, what's going on with the anecdotes, basically? Is this a, is this a distracting part of your sermon? And Moody told them the story. He gave them an anecdote to answer. And he said, it's interesting you say that. Let me, let me tell you, let me give you an anecdote. Let me answer you this way. He said, I had a reporter come to my church one time, and he was determined to, to kind of expose me as a fraud. You know, I didn't actually know this was what he was doing. I didn't even know he was there. But he told me afterwards this was his goal. And he said he came to my, you know, he was going to try to find holes in my stories, use some investigative journalism, and just prove that I'm a fraud somehow, either hearing stories that weren't true or something, right? And so I began telling him an anecdote, a story in the sermon that I was preaching that day. And he said, there was a gentleman walking down the streets of a city some time before. It was near Christmas time, and many of the shop windows were filled with Christmas presents and toys. And as this gentleman that he had read the story about passed along, he saw three little girls standing before a shop window. Two of them were trying to describe to the third the things that were in the window. It aroused his attention. He wondered what it could mean. So he went back and found that the middle one, she was blind. She couldn't see. And her two sisters were endeavoring to tell her how the things looked in the window. The gentleman stood beside them for some time and listened. He said it was most interesting to hear them trying to describe the different things that they saw to the blind child and what a difficult task it was. And that's when D.L. Moody in the sermon turned to the audience and said, This is how it feels for me to tell men about Christ. 
I may talk about him, yet they see no beauty in him that they should desire him. But if they will only come to him, if they will only hear him, if they will have their eyes open and reveal himself to them in all his loveliness and grace, then they could see. Now that reporter I mentioned who was in the crowd, he comes up to him and says, where did you hear that story? And uh, D.L. Moody says, you know, I read about it in the Boston paper. And he said, and the reporter said to him, well, that happened here in the streets of Baltimore. I'm the gentleman from that story. I'm the one who wrote that. That was me. And that man was so blown away by what just happened that he came to Christ on the spot, became one of the first converts that D.L. Moody had during his tour in that city. And he said, many and many a time, I have found that when the sermon and even the text has been forgotten, some story of truth has fastened itself in the hearer's mind and has borne fruit. Anecdotes are like windows to let light in upon a subject. They have a useful ministry, and I pray that God will bless them to every reader. As you listen to the story by Crazy Moody, and as you hear his anecdotes, and you think about his spirit for lost souls, you think about the souls he didn't forget that he did lose, or at least that were lost in that fire, and you think about the many, many who heard the gospel, I pray that and hope that the power of the Holy Spirit, this sermon will reach you and impact you too. The power of the Holy Ghost, Romans 15, 13. Power is the special and peculiar prerogative of God and God alone. Twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. God is God and power belongs to him. If he delegates a portion of it to his creatures, yet still it is his power. The son, although he is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run his race, yet has no power to perform his motions except as God directs him. The stars, although they travel in their orbits and none could stop them, yet have neither might nor force, they have only what God daily infuses into them. The tall archangel near his throne, who outshines a comet in its blaze, even though he is one of those who excel in strength, he has only what the Maker gave him. As for Leviathan, who would make the sea a boiling pot, that one would think the deep were hoary. As for the behemoth, who drinks up Jordan as a cup and boasts that he can snuff up rivers. As for all majestic creatures that are found on earth, they owe their strength to him who fashioned their bones of steel and made their muscles of brass." And when we think of man, if he has might or power, it is so small and insignificant that we can scarcely call it such. Yes, when it is at its greatest, when he sways his scepter, when he commands hosts, when he rules nations, still the power belongs to God. And it is true, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. This exclusive prerogative of God is to be found in each of the three persons of the glorious Trinity. The Father has power, for by his word were the heavens made and all the hosts of them. By his strength all things stand, and through him they fulfill their destiny. The Son has power, for like his Father he is the creator of all things. Without him nothing was made that was made, and by him all things consist. And... The Holy Spirit has power. It is concerning the power of the Holy Ghost that I speak this morning. And may you have a practical example of that attribute in your hearts when you feel the influence of the Holy Ghost being poured out upon me so that I am speaking the words of the living God to your souls and bestowed upon you when you are feeling the effects of it in your own spirits. We will look at the power of the Holy Ghost in three ways this morning. First, we are to view the power of the Spirit in the outward and visible displays of it. The power of the Spirit has not been dormant. It has exerted itself. Much has been done by the Spirit of God already, more than could have been accomplished by any being except the infinite, eternal, almighty Jehovah, of whom the Holy Spirit is one person. There are four works which are the outward and manifest signs of the power of the Spirit. Creation works, resurrection works, works of attestation or of witness, and works of grace. Of each of these works, I will speak very briefly. First, 
The Spirit has manifested the omnipotence of his power in creation works. For though not very frequently in Scripture, yet sometimes, creation is ascribed to the Holy Ghost as well as to the Father and the Son. The creation of the heavens above us is said to be the work of God's Spirit. This you will see at once by referring to the sacred scriptures, Job 26, 13th verse. By his Spirit he has garnished the heavens, his hand has formed the crooked serpent. All the stars of heaven are said to have been placed aloft by the Spirit, and one particular constellation called the Crooked Serpent is specifically pointed out as his handiwork. He loosed the bands of Orion, and he binds the sweet influences of the Pleiades. He made all those stars that shine in heaven. The heavens are garnished by his hands, and he formed the Crooked Serpent by his might." So also in those continued acts of creation which are still performed in the world, such as the bringing forth of man and animals, their birth and generation, these are ascribed also to the Holy Ghost. If you look at the 104th Psalm at the 29th verse, you read, You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. So that the creation of every man is the work of the Spirit, and the creation of all life and all flesh existence in this world is as much to be ascribed to the power of the Spirit as the first garnishing of the heavens or the fashioning of the crooked serpent. If you look in the first chapter of Genesis, you will see particularly that peculiar operation of the power upon the universe which was put forth by the Holy Spirit. You will then discover what was his special work. In the second verse of the first chapter of Genesis, we read, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. But before that era came, wherein man should be its principal tenant and monarch, The Creator gave up the whole world to confusion. He allowed the inward fires to burst up from beneath and melt all the solid matter so that all kinds of substances were commingled in one vast mass of disorder. The only name you could give to the world then was that it was a chaotic mass of matter. What it should be, you could not guess or define. It was entirely without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit came and stretching his broad wings bade the darkness disperse. And as he moved over it, all the different portions of matter came into their places and it was no longer without form and void, but became round like its sister planets and moved singing the praises of God, not discordantly as it had done before, but as one great note in the vast scale of creation. Milton very beautifully describes this work of the Spirit in bringing order out of confusion when the King of glory and his powerful word and spirit came to create new worlds. On heavenly ground they stood, And from the shore they viewed the vast, immeasurable abyss, outrageous as a sea, dark, wasteful, wild, up from the bottom, turned from furious winds, and surging waves as mountains to assault heaven's height, and with the center mix the pole. Silence, you troubled waves, and may the deep have peace, said that omnific word, your discord end. Then on the watery calm, His brooding wings the Spirit of God outspread, and vital virtue infused and vital warmth through the fluid mass. This, you see then, is the power of the Spirit. Could we have seen that earth all in confusion? We should have said, who can make a world out of this? The answer would have been, the power of the Spirit can do it. By the simple spreading of his dove-like wings, he can make all the things come together. Upon that there will be order where there was nothing but confusion. Nor is this all the power of the Spirit. We have seen some of his works in creation, but there was one particular instance of creation in which the Holy Spirit was more especially concerned, the formation of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Though our Lord Jesus Christ was born of a woman and made in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet the power that begat him was entirely in God the Holy Spirit. As the scriptures express it, the Holy One of Israel will overshadow you. He was begotten, as the Apostles' Creed says, begotten of the Holy Ghost. That holy thing which is born of you shall be called the Son of the Highest. The corporeal frame of the Lord Jesus Christ was a masterpiece of the Holy Spirit. I imagined his body to have excelled all others in beauty and to have been like that of the first man, the very pattern of what the body is to be in heaven when it shines forth in all its glory. That fabric in all its beauty and perfection was modeled by the Spirit. In his book were all the members written when as yet there was none of them. He fashioned and formed him, and here again we have another instance of the creative energy of the Spirit. A second manifestation of the Holy Spirit's power is to be found in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have ever studied this subject, you have perhaps been rather perplexed to find that sometimes the resurrection of Christ is ascribed to himself. By his own power and Godhead, he could not have been held by the bond of death, but as he willingly gave up his life, he had power to take it up again. In another portion of scripture, you find it ascribed to God the Father. He raised him up from the dead. Him has God the Father exalted. And many other passages of similar import. But again, it is said in scripture that Jesus Christ was raised by the Holy Spirit. Now all these things were true. He was raised by the Father because the Father said, Loosen the prisoner, let him go. Justice is satisfied. My law requires no more satisfaction. Vengeance has had its due. Let him go. Here he gave an official message which delivered Jesus from the grave. He was raised by his own majesty and power because he had a right to come out. And he felt he had, and therefore burst the bonds of death. He could no longer be held by them. But he was raised by the Spirit as to that energy which his mortal frame received, by which it rose again from the grave after having lain there for three days and three nights. If you want proofs of this, you must open your Bibles again. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also has suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And a further proof you may find in Romans 1.18. I love sometimes to be textual, for I believe the great fault of Christians is that they do not search the scriptures enough, and I will make them search them when they are here if they do not do so anywhere else. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Jesus from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. The resurrection of Christ then was affected by the agency of the spirit. And here we have a noble illustration of his omnipotence. Could you have stepped, as angels did, into the grave of Jesus and seen his sleeping body? You would have found it cold as any other corpse. Lift up the hand and it falls by the side. Look at the eye and it is glazed and there is a death thrust which must have annihilated life. See his hands, the blood does not pump in them. They're cold and motionless. Can that body live? Can it start up? Yes, and be an illustration of the might of the Spirit. For when the power of the Spirit came on him, as it was when it fell upon the dry bones of the valley, he arose in the majesty of his divinity, and bright and shining, astonished the watchmen so that they fled away. Yes, he arose never to die again, but lives forever, King of kings and Prince of the kings of the earth. The third of the works of the Holy Spirit, which have so wonderfully demonstrated his power, our attestation works, and by this I mean works of witnessing. When Jesus Christ went into the stream of baptism in the River Jordan, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove and proclaimed him God's beloved Son. That was what I style in attestation work. 
And when afterwards Jesus Christ raised the dead, when he healed the leper, when he spoke to diseases and they fled apace, when demons rushed in thousands from those who were possessed of them, it was done by the power of the Spirit. The Spirit dwelt in Jesus without measure, and by that power all those miracles were worked. These were attestation works. And when Jesus Christ was gone, you will remember that master attestation of the Spirit when he came like a rushing mighty wind upon the assembled apostles and cloven tongues sat upon them. And you will remember how he attested their ministry by giving them to speak with tongues as he gave them the words and how also miraculous deeds were done by them, how they taught, how Peter raised Dorcas, how he breathed life into Antichus, how great deeds were brought by the apostles as well as their master, so that mighty signs and wonders were done by the Holy Ghost, and many believed from it. Who will doubt the power of the Holy Spirit after that? Ah, those Trinitarian skeptics who deny the existence of the Holy Ghost and his absolute personality, what will they do when we show them his work in creation, resurrection, and attestation? They must rush in the very teeth of Scripture. But mark, it is a stone upon which if any man falls, he will be bruised. And if it falls upon him, as it will do if he resists it, it will grind him to powder. The Holy Spirit has power omnipotent, the power of God. Once more, if we want another outward and visible sign of the power of the Spirit, we may look at the works of grace. Behold a city where a sorcerer had the power, who has given out himself to be some great person. Then Philip enters it and preaches the word of God. Straightway a Simon Magus loses his power and himself seeks the power of the Spirit to be given to him, fancying that it might be purchased with money. Imagine, in modern times, a country where the inhabitants live in miserable conditions, feeding on reptiles and the lowest creatures. You might observe them bowing down before their idols and worshiping their false gods, and so plunged in superstition, so degraded and debased, you worried if they had souls or not. But then a Moffat or a Brainerd goes to them with the word of God in his hand. Oh, hear him preach as the Spirit gives him utterance and accompanies that word with power. They cast aside their idols. They hate and abhor their former lusts. They build houses where they now dwell. With God, they are in their right mind. They break the bow and cut the spear to pieces. The savage becomes a scholar. He who knew nothing begins to read the scriptures. And so out of the mouths of Gentiles, God attests the power of his mighty spirit. Take a household in this city. And we could guide you to many of these. The father is a drunkard. He has been the most desperate of characters. See him in his madness, and you might just as well meet an unchained tiger as much as a man. He seems as if he could rend any of you to pieces who should offend him. Mark his wife. She, too, has a similar spirit in her, and when he treats her ill, she can resist him. Many broils have been seen in that house, and often has the neighborhood been disturbed by the noise created between these two. As for their poor little children, see them in their rags and their nakedness, poor untaught things. Untaught, did I say? They are taught and well taught in the devil's school and are growing up to be the heirs of his damnation. But someone whom God has blessed by his spirit is guided to the house. He may be but a humble city missionary. Perhaps he speaks to such a one. Oh, says he, come and listen to the voice of God whether it is by his own agency or a minister's preaching, the word which is quick and powerful cuts to the sinner's heart. The tears run down his cheeks as they never have been seen before. He shakes and quivers. The strong man bows down. The mighty man trembles. And those knees that never shook begin to tremble together. That heart which never quailed before now begins to shake before the power of the Spirit. He sits down on a humble bench by the altar. He lets his knees bend and his lips utter a child's prayer. 
but even though it is a child's prayer, a prayer of a child of God, he becomes a changed character. Mark the Reformation in his house. That wife of his becomes a wonderful matron. Those children are the credit of the house, and in due time they grow up like olive branches around his table, adorning his house like polished stones. Pass by the house, no noise or broils, but songs of Zion. See him, no drunken revelry, for he has drained his last cup, and now swearing it off, he comes to God and is his servant. Now you will not hear at midnight those horrible shouts, but should there be a noise, it will be the sound of the solemn hymn of praise to God. Now, is there not such a thing as the power of the Spirit? Yes, I know a village once, perhaps the most profane in England, a village inundated by drunkenness and debauchery of the worst kind, where it was impossible almost for an honest traveler to stop in the public house without being annoyed by blasphemies. A place noted for violence and robbers. One man, the ringleader of all, listened to the voice of God. That man's heart was broken. The whole gang came to hear the gospel preached, and they sat and seemed to revere the preacher as if he were a god and not a man. These men became changed and reformed, and everyone who knows the place affirms that such a change would have never happened except by the power of the Holy Ghost. Let the gospel be preached and the Spirit poured out, and you will see that it has such power to change the conscience, to clean up the conduct, to raise the debased, to chastise and to curb the wickedness of the hearts, so you must glorify it. I say there is nothing like the power of the Spirit. Only let its power come, and indeed everything can be accomplished. Now, for the second point the inward and spiritual power of the Holy Spirit. What I have already spoken of may be seen. What I'm about to speak of must be felt, and no man will apprehend what I say with truth unless he has felt it. The other things I spoke of, even the infidel must confess it is true, for these things happen, and even the greatest blasphemer cannot deny it if he speaks without lies. But this is what the one will laugh at as zeal, and what the other will say is but the invention of our fevered fancies. However, we have a more sure word of testimony than all that they may say. We have a witness within us. We know it is the truth, and we are not afraid to speak of the inward spiritual power of the Holy Ghost. For starters, the Holy Ghost has a power over men's hearts. Now, men's hearts are very hard to change. If you want to get at them for any worldly object, you can do it. A cheating world can win a man's heart. A little gold can win a man's heart. A claim of fame and a little clamor of applause can win a man's heart. But there is not a minister breathing that can win man's heart himself. He can win his ears and make them listen, maybe, He can win his eyes and fix those eyes upon him for a time. He can win the attention, but the heart is very slippery. Yes, the heart is a fish that troubles all gospel fishermen to hold. You may sometimes pull it almost out of the water, but slimy as an eel, it slips between your fingers and you have not captured it after all. Many a man has fancied that he has caught the heart, but has been disappointed. It would take a strong hunter to overtake the heart on the mountains. It is too fast for human feet to approach. The Spirit alone has power over man's heart. Do you even try your power on the heart? If any man thinks that a minister can convert the soul, I wish he would try. Let him go and be a Sunday school teacher. He will take his class and he will have the best books that can be obtained. He will have the best rules. He will take the best boy in his class and if he is not tired in a week, I will be very much mistaken. Let him spend four or five Sundays trying. But he will say, the young fellow is impossible. Let him try another and he will have to try another and another and another before he will manage to convert one. He will soon find that it is not by might nor power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. 
Can a minister convert? Can he touch the heart? David said, your hearts are as fat as grease. Yes, that is quite true, and we cannot get through so much grease at all. Our sword cannot get at the heart. It is enclosed in so much fatness. It is harder than a millstone. Many a good old Jerusalem blade has been blunted against the hard heart. Many a piece of the true steel that God has put into the hand of his servants has had the edge dulled by being set up against the sinner's heart. We cannot reach the soul, but the Holy Spirit can. My beloved can put in his hand by the hole in the door and my bowels will move for sin. He can give a sense of blood-bought pardon that will dissolve a heart of stone. He can speak with that voice which wakes the dead and bids the sinner rise and makes the guilty conscience dread the death that never dies. He can make Sinai's thunders audible. Yes, and he can make the sweet whispers of Calvary enter into the soul. He has power over the heart of man. And here is a glorious proof of the omnipotence of the Spirit that he has rule over the heart. But if there is one thing more stubborn than the heart, it is the will. My Lord will be will, as Bunyan calls him in the Holy War, is a fellow who will not easily be bent. The will, especially in some men, is a very stubborn thing. And in all men, if the will is once stirred up to opposition, there is nothing that can be done with them. Free will, somebody believes in. Free will, many dream of. Free will. Wherever is that to be found? Once there was free will in paradise, and a terrible mess free will made for us. It spoiled all paradise and turned Adam out of the garden, Free will was once in heaven, but it turned the glorious archangel out and a third part of the stars of heaven fell into the abyss. I want nothing to do with free will, but I will try to see whether I have got a free will within me and I find I have very free will to do evil, but very poor will to do that which is good. Free will enough for me to sin, but when I would to do good, evil is present with me. Yet some still boast a free will. I wonder whether those who believe in it have any more power over a person's wills than I have. I know I have not any. I find the old proverb very true. One man can bring a horse to the water, but a hundred cannot make him drink. I find that I can bring you all to the water and a great many more than can get into this chapel, but I cannot make you drink. I don't think a hundred ministers could make you drink. I have read old Roland Hill and Whitfield and several others to see what they did, but I cannot discover a plan of turning your will. I cannot coax you, and you will not yield by any manner of means. I do not think any person has power over his fellow creature's will, but the Spirit of God has. I will make them willing on the day of my power. He makes the unwilling sinner so willing that he is overbearing after the gospel. He who was obstinate now hurries to the cross. He who laughed at Jesus now hangs on his mercy. And he who would not believe is now made by the Holy Spirit to do it, not only willingly, but eagerly. He is happy, is glad to do it, rejoices in the sound of Jesus' name, and delights to run in the way of God's commands. The Holy Spirit has power over the will. And yet, there is one more thing which I think is rather worse than the will. You will guess what I mean. The will is somewhat worse than the heart to bend, but there is one thing that excels the will in its naughtiness, and that is the imagination. I hope that my will is managed by divine grace, but I am afraid my imagination is not at times. Those who have a fair share of imagination know what a difficult thing it is to control. You cannot restrain it. It will break the reins. You will never be able to manage it. The imagination will sometimes fly up to God with such a power that eagles' wings cannot match it. It sometimes has such might that it can almost see the king in his beauty and the land which is very far off. With regard to myself... My imagination will sometimes take me over the gates of iron 
across the infinite unknown to the very gates of pearl and discover the blessed glorified. But if it is potent one way, it is another. For my imagination has taken me down to the vilest kennels and sewers of earth. It has given me thoughts so dreadful that while I could not avoid them, yet I was thoroughly horrified at them. These thoughts will come, and when I feel in the holiest of frame, the most devoted to God and the most earnest in prayer, it often happens that that is the very time when the plague breaks out the worst. But I rejoice and think of one thing, that I can cry out when this imagination comes upon me. I know it is said in the book of Leviticus, when an act of evil was committed, if the maiden cried out against it, then her life was to be spared. And so it is with the Christian. If he cries out, there is hope. Can you chain your imagination? No. But the power of the Holy Ghost can Oh, it will do it, and it does do it in the end of all things, but it can also do it on earth. But the last thing is the future and desired effects. For after all, though the Holy Spirit has done so much, he cannot say, it is finished. Jesus Christ could exclaim concerning his own labor, it is finished. But the Holy Spirit cannot say that. He has more to do yet. And until the consummation of all things, it will not be said by the Holy Spirit, it is finished. What then has the Spirit to do? First, he has to perfect us in holiness. There are two kinds of perfection which a Christian needs. One is the perfection of justification in the person of Christ. And the other is the perfection of sanctification, worked in him by the Holy Spirit. At present, corruption still rests even in the hearts of the regenerate. At present, the heart is partially impure. At present, there still are lusts and evil imaginations. But, oh, my soul rejoices to know that the day is coming when God will finish the work which he has begun. And he will present my soul, not only perfect in Christ, but perfect in the Spirit without spot or blemish or any such thing. And is it true that this poor depraved heart is to become as holy as that of God? And is it true that this poor depraved heart is to become as holy as that of God? And is it true that this poor spirit which often cries, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this sin and death, will get rid of sin and death? I will have no evil things to vex my ears and no unholy thoughts to disturb my peace. Oh, happy hour. May it be hurried. Just before I die, sanctification will be finished, but not till that moment will I ever claim perfection in myself. But at that moment, when I depart, my spirit will have its last baptism in the Holy Spirit's fire It will be put in the crucible for its last try in the furnace. And then, free from all dross and fine like a wedge of pure gold, it will be presented at the feet of God without the least degree of dross or mixture. O glorious hour, O blessed moment. I think I would long to die even if there were no heaven, if I might just have that last purification come from Jordan's stream most white from the washing. Oh, to be washed white, clean, pure, perfect, not an angel more pure than we will be. Yes, like God himself, I will be holy. And I will be able to say in a double sense, great God, I am clean. Through Jesus' blood, I am clean. Through the Spirit's work, I am clean too. Won't we proclaim the power of the Holy Ghost in making us fit to stand before our Father in heaven. Another great work of the Holy Spirit, which is not yet accomplished, is the bringing on of the latter day glory. In a few more years, I know not when, I know not how, the Holy Spirit will be poured out in a far different style from the present. During the last few years, it has been the case that many operations have consisted in very little pouring out of the Spirit. Ministers have gone on in dull routine, continually preaching, preaching, 
preaching and little good has been done. I do hope that perhaps a fresh era has dawned upon us and that there is a better pouring out of the Spirit even now. For the hour is coming and it may be even now when the Holy Ghost will be poured out again in such a wonderful manner that many will run to and fro and knowledge will be increased. The knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the surface of the great deep. When his kingdom will come and his will shall be done on earth even as it is in heaven. We are not going to be dragging on forever like Pharaoh with the wheels of his chariot. My heart wonders about the days when the sons and daughters of God again will prophesy and the young men see visions and the old men shall dream dreams. Perhaps there will be no miraculous gifts for they will not be required there. But yet there will be such a miraculous amount of holiness, such an extraordinary fervor of prayer, such a real communion with God and so much vital religion and such a spread of the doctrines of the cross that everyone will see that the Spirit is poured out like water and the rains are descending from above. For that, let us pray. Let us continually labor for it and seek it from God. One more work of the Spirit, which will especially manifest His power, is the general resurrection. We have reason to believe from Scripture that the resurrection of the dead, while it will be affected by the voice of God and of His Word, the Son, will also be brought about by the Spirit. The same power which raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies. The power of the resurrection is perhaps one of the finest proofs of the works of the Spirit. Ah, my friends, you could see through the dirt, or if the green grass could be cut from it and we could look about six feet deep into its bowels, what a world it would seem. What should we see? Bones, carcasses, rottenness, worms, corruption. And you would say, can these dry bones live? Can they start back up? Yes, and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the dead will be raised. He speaks, and they are alive. See them scattered. Bone comes to his bone. See them naked. Flesh comes upon them. See them still lifeless. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain. When the winds of the Holy Spirit comes, they live, and they stand upon their feet an exceedingly great army. I have attempted to speak of the power of the Holy Spirit, and I trust I have shown it to you. But we must now have a moment or two for practical applications. The Spirit is very powerful, Christian. What do you infer from that fact? Why, that you never need to distrust the power of God to carry you to heaven. Oh, that sweet verse was laid to my soul yesterday. His tried almighty arm is raised for your defense. Where can the power reach you? Or what can pluck you this? The power of the Holy Spirit is your anchor, and all his omnipotence defends you. Can your enemies overcome omnipotence? Then they can conquer you. Can they wrestle with deity and hurl him to the ground? Well, then they might conquer you, for the power of the Spirit is our power. The power of the Spirit is our might. Once again, Christians, if this is the power of the Spirit, why should you doubt anything? There is your son. There is that wife of yours from whom you have supplicated so frequently. Do not doubt the Spirit's power. Though he tarries, wait for him. There is your husband, O holy woman. And you have wrestled for his soul. And though he is ever so hardened and desperate a wretch and treats you poorly still, there is power in the Spirit. And O oh, you who have come from barren churches with scarcely a leaf upon the tree, do not doubt the power of the Spirit to raise you up. For it will be a pasture for flocks, a den of wild donkeys, open but deserted until the Spirit is poured out from on high. And then the parched ground will be made a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. And, O oh, you members of Park Street, 
You who remember what your God has done for you, especially never distrust the power of the Spirit. You have seen the wilderness blossom like caramel. You have seen the desert blossom like the rose. Trust him for the future. Then go out and labor with this conviction that the power of the Holy Ghost is able to do anything. Go to your missionary enterprises. Go to your preaching in your rooms with the conviction that the power of the Spirit is our great help. And now, lastly, to you sinners. What is there to be said to you about this power of the Spirit? Why, to me, there is some hope for some of you. I cannot save you. I cannot get at you. I make you cry. And sometimes you wipe your eyes and the moment is all over. But I know my master can. That is my consolation. Chief of sinners, there is hope for you. This power can save you as well as anybody else. It is able to break your heart, though it is an iron one, to make your eyes run with tears, though they have been like rocks before. His power is able this morning, if you will, to change your heart, to turn the current of all your ideas, to make you at once a child of God, to justify you in Christ. There is power enough in the Holy Spirit. You are not straightened in him, but in your own bowels. He is able to bring sinners to Jesus. He is able to make you willing on the day of his power. Are you willing this morning? Has he gone so far as to make you desire his name, to make you wish for Jesus? Then, O sinner, while he draws you, say, draw me. I am wretched without you. Follow him. Follow him. And while he leads, tread in his footsteps. And rejoice that he has begun a good work in you. For there is evidence that he will continue it even to the end. And O despairing one, put your trust in the power of the Spirit. Rest on the blood of Jesus and your soul is safe, not only now, but throughout all eternity. God bless you, my hearers. Amen. The power of the Holy Spirit, I think, is a impressive sermon. I think it's a little bit difficult to preach on the Holy Spirit because so often the Holy Spirit is one member of the Trinity that is not treated sometimes like a member of the Trinity. And yet to remember that right now the Holy Spirit is giving power to believers. He is, you know, a part of each of our lives. He is showing us how to know everything we need to know from Scripture. He is empowering our prayers. He is doing so much for us all the time. And I think Moody does a really good job of reminding us that we need to be in constant praise of God and constant praise of the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in our life. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by John Godas. John Godas is the pastor at Shawnee Bible Church in Shawnee, Kansas. If you enjoyed this episode, we also encourage you to check out the other shows here on Revive Studios. If you have not yet subscribed to Martyrs and Missionaries, what are you waiting on? It's a fantastic show uh, telling you the incredible stories of different martyrs and or missionaries every single week. Uh, every single episode and absolutely incredible stuff really good stuff i always get a little bit of a preview of what's coming and every time i'm just blown away by the amount of research and just how succinct the episodes are so we definitely encourage you to check those out if that's not enough for you revive devos every single day a devotional two to three minutes long we mentioned moody was on some of those devotionals men like saint augustine martin luther richard baxter uh, andrew murray george mueller uh, Lemuel Haynes, Oswald Chambers, all of those guys, Jonathan Edwards, could be found in Revive Devo's catalogs, two to three minutes, really bite-sized snacks of devotionals. And we highly encourage you to subscribe to that and get that in your, your life just every single day. So we hope you check out all the shows at Revive Studios and always working on more for you. This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts. Parent, volunteer, employee. With your different roles and busy schedule, how can you find time to complete the degree you once started? Cornerstone University's programs are designed for busy adults like you. 
Take one course at a time, back-to-back to move through your degree quickly. Attend through an on-campus, live stream, or 100% online format, whichever works best for you. If you're ready to go further in your goals, we're here to make it possible. Achieve without ceasing. Learn more at adult.cornerstone.edu. This is Michael J. Fox. Learn more about the Michael J. Fox Foundation's work and how you can help speed a cure at michaeljfox.org. The Michael J. Fox Foundation, here until Parkinson's isn't. 